right. Well, I was. Yeah, well, we're going to introduce. Uh, we're going to interview Evie Lentwalk in uh, just a second. She's um, actually dealing. She's talking with the New York City Parks Department, uh, Parks Enforcement. You know, so, uh, okay, so I want to go back to Dane Kelly. Is this such interruption that we've had thus far, even though Evie has permits. So just bringing people uh, a live uh, abusive system just because they can. But uh, so Evie. Okay. So uh, what's the name? Yeah, you're on camera. So she's not. No, push, pull her into me. I can't see her. Oh, there she is. I have my support network with me. This is Allie. And I'm Evie Lidlock. I'm the founder and executive director of Witness to Mass Incarceration. And this event today is to launch the MAP, which is an online directory of formerly incarcerated led services and businesses. We, we want to, number one, populate the MAP with formerly incarcerated led services and businesses and tell the public. Great, I'm sorry. I can't hear you. We want to populate what? We, want, we have an online directory. Incarcerated led services and businesses across the yes. country. Our goal is to tell the public that if they want to help us to lift us out of poverty and help us with a second chance, that they should be buying, getting their haircuts from us, their eyeglasses, their catering, and their services, their legal services, their accounting services. So our goal is to become uh, an, em an employment powerhouse and a civic force. That's amazing. That's very interesting. That, uh, a lot of, one yeah. of the challenges that formerly incarcerated people have is, you know, job discrimination. And so an event like Suitcase Sunday, which showcases businesses that formerly incarcerated people uh, have started, uh, very important because if you have your own business, then you're not uh, dependent upon other people. And plus, you're free to hire other formerly incarcerated uh, people, help give them their start. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, what so made you? Before we go on to the next uh, next interview subject. Um, no, I'm good. I just would like I would like everybody out there to know that if they know of a formerly incarcerated person who is starting a business, the best thing they can do is support them. Well, let so, me ask you: Do you help people find employment? Do you help people find employment? Uh, well, there's two tracks. One is. Do, one is uh, the self-employment. Well, we're, in self-employment, we're trying to get newly released and formerly incarcerated people to apprentice with the businesses we already have. Excellent. Second, and that is what we perceive to be our most effective track because we have a gentleman here who has a half a million dollars to start a trucking business and he needs drivers. So we are going to search for and to get a license is $5,000. So we can support about 10 to 25 people getting their licenses and starting trucking. We want to be very concrete about this. Now, in terms of wage earning jobs and corporations, there, there are two things that concern me. Not only do we need skills, but uh, we need the employers to be trained on, on our diverse and population, and they need to be inclusive of us and understand what things might impact us at the workplace. For example, I was in solitary confinement, and if you offered me a job for $100,000 and you did put me in a small room with no windows, I couldn't take the job. So there are things there are things that prevent us from doing certain things, and as long as we educate employers, I think we're fine. Great. I'm not letting her go, Jeffrey. This is, I have to get, you know, and I'm going to have to go back to James Kelly because there was a glitch. I want to hear a little bit. I know we'll just take it as long as we will, but I want to do a service to what these people are doing. Now, how do you spell your name? How do you spell your name? Uh, it's Evie, E-V-I-E, short for Evelyn. Last name is L-I-T-W-O-K. W-O-K, uh, Evie. And my organization is Witness to Mass Incarceration, and the website's the same name, but .org. Witness to Mass Incorporation .org. Now, now you were you said that you were in solitary confinement. Correct. Um, do you get to say how long or how you how you're out or what, what about I, that? What I will tell you is it's the most it, it permanently damaged my physical, mental, and emotional um, serenity. I, I'll never be the same person after that experience. Uh, you can't put someone into a frighteningly small place with fluorescent lights 
I was 64 years old when I was in solitary confinement. I'm going to be 70 in two weeks. And as soon as I went in day one, I got severe high blood pressure, vertigo, and migraines. How does and someone like you, how does someone as beautiful as you wind up in solitary confinement? I wrote an article about a woman who died due to the lack of medical care in prison. Um, a, we had it. We have 1,300 women in the prison. We have a physician's assistant that sees all 1,300. And whether you have cancer, a broken foot, a cyst, or a heart attack, he tells you the same thing. You're fat, walk on the track, drink water. So when a woman, uh, named Miriam Hernandez, went in to see him, and she looked clearly like she was on, uh, you know, in her last stages of life, he get, instead of examining her, he gave her the fat speech, and two weeks later, her gallbladder burst, and she was dead. And I was crazed because people were getting blind because no one was being taken out for vision care. People were dying of breast cancer who, whose cancer was never treated. So I wrote an article saying this was a preventable death. And they arrested me, shackled me, and said, we're going to keep you for as long as we want to keep you because you wrote about an officer. I wow, Jeffrey, isn't that perfect? We just did a show on whistleblowers. So she's a whistleblower in the jail, and this is what happens. You go into solitary confinement. Let me ask you, I want to tell you, Evie, what you're doing is amazing. You are getting businesses together. You are giving people their life back. So don't tell me you went through this for nothing because you had to come out and you are creating and giving people life. How could you? I mean, that is so special. So I will tell you this that had I not been arrested, I would have been retired and living in the East Hampton and doing uh, progressive politics and writing my senators. Now, but having had been in prison, I know that what the work I was doing was not even close to enough, that I'm not unhappy I went to prison twice. I'm not unhappy I was in solitary confinement because it gave me insight I could never have had without it. And it gave me a, uh, as I said, I'm going to be 70, and I want to go down through this life having an impact in some way. You are amazing. I would like to have you on and learn more about your cases at another time. Jeffrey yeah. and I, uh, we're just uh, <laughs> tearing it down. we we got to gotta do this. Nobody else is doing it. So we're here. God bless you, Evie. Wait, before you move on, I want to hear, we, there was a glitch. James Kelly, I wanted to hear Don't what you were out. fighting. Don't forget Allie. Oh, Allie. Who could forget, forget Allie? Allie? <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Much. James, you're the camera guy. You're there. Where are you? And then tell us a little bit of your background because it may have been a glitch and I may have missed it well, on the show. Very briefly, my background is uh, I'm fighting for the process of court. Systemically, we're deprived of due process. You're and fighting due, for due process in court because you experience a lack of due process in your match in your family law cases, right? Correct, absolutely. But I sit and I do court watching for other people in a variety of different cases, and I still see a lack of due process systemically. So one of the ways we we lack due process is we lack an independent, neutral, electronic record of the proceedings. Court reporters are experts. The transcripts are expert opinions. Now, if we don't have a new, I, I want to tell you something. On that note, James, I noticed there were there were transcripts. They missed things. They were wrong. You know, they were selective with some things in the transcript. So there's a lot of things that go on with the transcript. And you said you're fighting for cameras in the courtroom, right? That's right. I, I have a. Uh... A federal suit against the New York State Unified Court System in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, and uh, that's that's something that uh, I, I'm going to. We all need to get behind that. And I want to tell you, many years ago, I introduced a database, a sheet. I gave it in to, but nobody wanted the database. In other words, if you, they didn't want that because you can show a pattern of judges ruling a certain way with certain lawyers and certain 
someone always wins the custody, always gives away the child or this money or that. You show a pattern and you also show a pattern of financial wealth before you come in and whether you're accumulating wealth as a judge while you're in, who you give the, the children's attorney. Uh, I had a case with, I had, I was before a judge who gave a hundred percent of her donors, um, they, she made them the children's attorney. She appointed them. Uh, who were they looking out for, the children or their next appointment? Exactly. And I can go on and on with that for hours. I really can, to a level of detail that would make your head spin. And perhaps we can do that uh, on another day. Yeah. But uh, it's... it's okay. I, I'm about to have a glitch soon where I might have to switch microphones. No problem. Right here for you. And it might not be as good. No problem. Tell us where you are and uh, what you're there for. Well, I'm here to interview people uh, about uh, about the businesses that they've started and created. Uh, the park is. Yeah, it's, 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 this is um, Baisley Pond Park. Baisley Pond Park in Jamaica, Queens. And uh, there, there are quite a few people around. I mean, if you can see in the background, I'm going to pan. And you can see. And these are people who are incarcerated, coming out, trying to start a business, trying to survive in this world, trying to make a better life, right? Right. People end up going to jail, like myself, and we come out and we have obstacles in front of us. We have, oh, gee, you were in jail. You must be a bad person. Well, gee, if you got no due process, how can you even make that determination? That's so well said. That's so well said. All right, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna go mobile. We're gonna interview a few more formerly incarcerated business owners. Wow, let's go, Jeffrey. Yep, it's me. Some people saying, uh, Jeffrey, come on over, Lorenzo. Okay, come around and be interviewed, my friend. Hello, Jeffrey. I'm Jim Kelly. Oh, Lorenzo. Hello, Lorenzo. How you doing? Good. Well, tell us a little bit about what you do here. I can't see him. Um, I, I can't see him. This is all hard. A clothing brand modeled after the first two letters of my name and the last two letters of my name. Um, hey, hold on a second. I can't see him, James. Okay. I, don't... I was trying to show you the table. I appreciate it. That's great. Now, let's see. Lorenzo. Is that your name? Is that your name, Lorenzo? Yes. How are you? I'm all as well. Yourself? Okay. It looks like a beautiful day. What are you doing there? Say it again? What are you doing there? We got the logo for 12 brand here. We got t-shirts, female leggings, and you know, shorts, and other type of t-shirts and things of that nature. You, uh, are you, you, you created those logos, and you're creating shirts, and you're creating apps and all? Yes, it says so my name is Lorenzo, so the first two letters is L-O, and the last two letters is Z-O. That's how you get the logo. That's wonderful. How did you start doing that? What made you start creating uh, caps and shirts? I, you know, I spent 22 years on my conviction and I had a lot of time to think about a lot of things. So this is one of the things that I wanted to do. And during COVID, when things started getting bad all over the place, I had to come up with a plan and generate funds. How long have you been out of jail? Almost four years now. Uh, now how'd you get out? I got out through the Pennsylvania Innocence Project, along with the Justice Justice Foundation, along with Michael Wiseman. Wow. And so has it been difficult for you to uh, find work or have help? Nah, just COVID. Just Everything COVID? Yeah. And do you know Roderick Johnson? Yes, that's a good friend of mine. I'm about to go see him when I leave here. Oh, he's a great guy. He's also... Yes. 
yeah, so he's some he's very smart and all. Hopefully, mm -hmm. this organization could also help Bobby Johnson. Yes, and that's he, probably yeah. a good friend of mine. So like, we both was in the same situation. It's crazy because uh, we hear something funny one time. The prosecution filed their petition against him and they used my name. <laughs> oh my goodness! I like to hear that story. Um, you know, Roderick Johnson, he was uh, he was co-hosting the show. He's a great YouTuber. And he co-hosted the show with me to help Melvin Ortiz. You know Melvin this Ortiz? Was, this was doing within the last week, right? Yes, that was the live feed. Tell me about that. You told me about yeah. that. You got to watch it. He did a great job. And we got to fight for Melvin Ortiz, right? Melvin Ortiz, well, I support it. So, you know, at the end of the day, like, if you need me to do it, come on, I'll come on. Okay, that's great. Love to have you. Nice and to have you. Thanks a lot. Where could people buy your shirts or your hats? Where you could they buy it? You could go to Lozo Couture on Instagram, or you could go to Lozo.com, LozoCouture.com, and see all the merchandise. You had to be fancy and put the couture in there, right? You got to be yeah. a fancy guy. Yeah. All right. Yeah, get a little attention. Probably some attention from guys like this. Right? <laughs> you know? Oh, man. You know, oh, look at that. Huh? Look at like, that. You guys. My, Jeff, like my brother, you know, he was also part of the team, team, team foundation. So, you know, a lot of good things going on. Good 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 That's right. That's your brother from a different mother, right? Exactly. exactly, 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 exactly. <laughs> That's wonderful. Jeffrey yeah, is yeah, just yeah, amazing. Yeah. God bless. God bless. Thank you so much, and I'm glad you're out. Okay, let's go to our, uh, we're going to go to our next guest, not, not far away. Leslie. Hello, Leslie. Good. I'm Jim Kelly. Leslie Robinson. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about your story and your organization? So Jeff and I. Jeff I can't see her. Put move her, move her to the center. Yeah. And we have an organization called Beyond the Forest. I created this game, and then brought Jeffrey in as a partner to help people to be able to talk about all kinds of things that are sitting inside of themselves. I can't hear her. I can't hear her. I can't hear her well. I can't hear her well. Look in the camera. Look at Susan. I'm sitting right now. Okay. Just give me a little instruction so I don't have like. Oh, there you go. You found it now. Go ahead, girl. What, what's your story? What is that? What's, what's your story? What's your name and what's your story? Yes. So my story is I spent 30 years working in homeless shelters, prisons, runaway youth, 20 years foster care consultant, uh, two years as Department of Defense Reintegration Specialist, on and on and on. And I found that people have no way to process their experiences and their emotions and what's going on, which creates all kinds of chaos and confusion and adds to the trauma that gets compounded because of the way people treat each other when they're traumatized. And I thought, you know, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be something aside from walking into a therapist's office, which almost nobody has the opportunity to do. So I started creating games to heal together, to process their lives together, to be able to have really deep feelings with other people so people laugh and they cry. There's fun mixed in, there's drawing, they're creative, they're gentle questions that help people to open up and speak to your comfort level. So because there's such an enormous need to fill that void between there being almost nothing out here, these games are really helping people to feel, to move forward in their lives. Hello? Our experiences. Once we do that with the passion of people, we can then start to move forward. There's okay, so, 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 so that's amazing. You're trying to help people get back into life. What's the name of your organization there? What is it? Beyond the Bars? So the company that has all the games is Transformation Games. It's spelled R-A-N-C-E, the number four M-A-T-I-O-N games. Jeff's and my company for the reentry work and the and the long-term prison work. 
is beyond the bars. So they're, they're two different. So, okay, great. Beyond the bars. And then I didn't get the first one. The first one was what? Transformation games with, with a strange spelling. So it's trans, like you're going into a trans. Oh, trans for the number four, four nation games. Um, right. Dot org. Um, dot com. Dot, dot com. Dot com. Okay, great. Great. Thank you very much. Good work. Thank you so very much. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank, Thank you. you. So, so we can just get like a visual here of this wonderful banner for recharge. The viewers can see that. See up here. Just the camera from the sheet down there. Yeah, but uh, look, I believe in recharge. I co own it. I partnered with Leslie and she created it. And you know, I use it myself, and it does help formerly incarcerated people reconnect with their friends and family. Uh, like my brother said to me, I don't know what to say. I don't know what not to say. I don't know what to ask. I don't know what not to ask. And on my end of it, it was hard to communicate with people that I knew had not been incarcerated before. So hence partnering uh, with Leslie on this great, uh, great game. And, uh, you know, rechargethegame.com. No. That's a very good point because a lot of people don't understand the trauma that people experienced in jail and they don't know how to even uh, talk to people or engage or social or, or try and just live a normal life. They have to be reintegrated into life and that's so important that you have that. Right. Okay. Great. Well, let's listen. Let's move on for the uh, next business. Um, Lead on. Yeah. Let's. Yeah. Take care. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Let's go over here. Okay, so Susan. Yes, hello. Okay, let me just. Okay, so we have Sharon Richardson from Just Soul Catering, and I'm going to let Jim, uh, our on site correspondent, take it from here. You and uh, Susan, you and Jim interview Sharon. Okay. Hello, Sharon. I'm Jim Sharon. It smells so delicious. Tell me a little bit about your story and, and tell me a I can't hear her. Um, James. James. James, I can't hear her. Come closer. Oh, someone one second. Susan, you're asking something? I cannot hear her. You have to bring her closer. Bring her up front. To the, she to can't the, hear you. We got we to gotta bring this a little closer. Come up front. Yeah. I can't hear her at all. I can hear you, but uh, come close. Come, can you come around and come closer to the? To the I think that this noise in the background is competing here. I see the generator background. It's, it's, we're gonna move. We're gonna move away from the generator a little bit. Okay, go ahead. Most important that these people have a chance to be heard. There's due process on legal minutes. You may not get due process in court, but you'll get due process on legal minutes. I want to hear what's going on. Say that one more time. I said you may not get due process in court, but you'll get due process on my show on legal minutes. I appreciate that. And so, it is so important. You don't have process, you have nothing. Yes. Absolutely, you have nothing. If there's no leave, nothing. That's right. If there's no due process and there's no access to a fair court, you have nothing. It's a game. It's just a facade. So when you interview these people, let them come right up to the camera, and because I can't hear them otherwise, and people are saying they can't hear. Okay. Can, can you hear now? I can hear you, but um, 
when you when you interview them, let them come right up to the camera so I could see them and hear them. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna move this around a little bit to the opposite direction of the generator. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. How's that? Is that better? Yes, I can hear you. Come, come even closer, because what you say is very important. She's gone. Okay. No, she's she's temporarily gone. Okay. Are you able to hear us better now? Yes, I hear you very well. Now I want to hear her very well. What's her okay. name and what her business and and what's going on? Hello. Tell us a little bit about your business. Hi, my name is Sharon Richardson. I am the owner of Justice Opportunity for the Justice of our 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 and we teach an entrepreneurship class um, with women who come in to get a paid stipend to learn how to get out of their own way and become entrepreneurs in whatever business they want to, you know, get a business in. We mostly talk about the food industry. Once they graduate, they get their hands That's a beautiful That's thing. Great. How do we get in touch with Just Soul Catering? So to get in touch with Just Soul Catering, my website is www just J-U-S-T, soul, S-O-U-L, my phone number is 718-313-1885, and my email is just soul, and Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you very much. Do you have a question? Yeah, well, first of all, next time I want them to come where you're standing because it's still low, people still complaining. Um, saying they can't hear because they want to hear. So she has a catering business called Just Soul, S-O-U-L, Catering. And they could look her up. She also gave her phone number, but she go, she created this catering business and she helps other incarcerated people and teaches them about uh, being an entrepreneur. Is that correct? That is correct. And I'm going to have her give her her number and... Her, uh, Let her come closer. Come where you are. Let her okay. come all the way up. There you go. Hello. How are you? What is your name? Not good. Not good. Can you? It's not good. Not good. Uh, well, here we go. We're going to put it back in. Let's see. Hello? Hello? Uh, this happens. As you know. Hello? I can't see you now. <laughs> <laughs> what is the, uh james go out and come back in this is uh this is the way it goes this is technology right it works great for an election though um so these people have gotten together to uh ensure to help people who have been incarcerated and they are oh, here, here, here we go Okay, James, I see you again. Something happened. It wasn't clear at all. Unfortunately, we're losing signal. There's a lot of background noise, and this is one of the challenges with live broadcasting. Why don't you bring people, why don't you stay in a more quiet area, and maybe people can come over to you? I'll see and if I can arrange that. It's going to take me a little time. Okay. Take care. Okay, so I will see you soon. Okay. All right. Hey, guys, uh, ask me any questions if you want while we're waiting for them to come back in. Um, this was uh, Jeffrey Deskovic. I mean, he's doing the job of the government, of the attorney general, of the DA, of everyone, of the media. I mean, this guy um, spent, as you know, 
over 16 years in jail from being a, a child, 17 years old, and put in jail his birthdays, his holidays, um, and um, and he could have he shouldn't have been in jail because his DNA exonerated him. But they didn't deal with it. Here, oh, here they go. There you go. You ready, James? Are you ready? No, I, I need to charge the. Uh, okay. All I'm right. Need a few minutes. Okay, you let me know. Just put your hand up when you're ready. Um, so um, he comes out. He's not bitter. And he fights and he wins his case. He goes to law school. Um, I mean, a lot of people wouldn't even want to be bothered with the law or become a lawyer, but he does. He takes the bar. He's a lawyer and he's out there and creates an organization to help others. And he really walks the walk and talks the talk. I mean, he actually goes and, and helps all these other organizations that are helping. All he wants to do is help make a difference. So uh, basically, you could go to Jeff, Jeffrey Deskovic's uh, foundation, and uh, he will have all these other organizations, and you can ask him. He's also on Instagram. Look him up, Jeffrey Deskovic. But there's so many different organizations, and when people have been in jail, especially solitary confinement, it is uh, very traumatic for someone, right? And uh, uh, what we what we see is there are many people who are in jail that really got there by a, a, a false process. I mean, they didn't have effective assistance of counsel. They didn't have due process. They didn't have a fair access to the court. And so anybody could wind up in jail like that, right? It doesn't take much to put the wrong people in jail. And what about the prosecutors who, um, as Thomas Hoffman, the attorney that I had on said, a lot of them, they withhold exculpatory information, which is a Brady violation, but it's, it's, uh, it's criminal. You are responsible for keeping people in jail and putting people in jail because you didn't, you you know, as a prosecutor, you're not your job is not to get a conviction. That's not your job. The prosecutor has a very special role, and that role is to pursue justice. Whether that means, and pursue justice according to our constitution and our rights. In other words, the criminal defendant, the one accused of a crime, their rights have to be protected. Their rights to um, confront their witnesses, the right for due process, the right for a jury trial uh, of their peers. I mean, there's so much that goes into protecting their rights. And if you take that away, then anyone could accuse anyone of a crime and any anyone could go to jail, right? It's so easy. I mean, we see people, January 6th people, the vic I call them victims. They're taking plea bargains, um, you know, put in jail, uh, many say they haven't had due process. I heard some had solitary confinement. Uh, I, you know, this is what I'm hearing. There's a lot of uh, concern. There was a grandmother who had to take a plea bargain, and she didn't have any um, any ill will towards anyone when she went to the rally. She wasn't looking uh, to cause any uh, problems. She didn't commit uh, crimes intentionally by being in the Capitol. And there's questions as how, how people got into the Capitol. But these are the things that's going on. But these are the things that can go on if you don't have due process. Okay, let's see. I think James Kelly is ready. Are you ready now? I am here. Can you hear me okay? Oh, oh my gosh. It's like a new beginning. <laughs> oh, no, it's so appropriate because we've just gone through a little bit of uh, difficulty. And now we have a new beginning together. So let's do it. Okay, unfortunately, when you go live sometimes, especially in a loud environment, it becomes a challenge. And despite my, my best attempts to pick up a, a better microphone this morning, uh, it just wasn't enough to overcompensate that type of environment. Uh, I have texted Jeffrey, who is way in the background over there, and uh, I have asked him. Uh, it's okay, we got you. He'll come over when he comes over. James, you have such an interesting story and you're fighting. So let's hear about you. Go ahead. Tell us exactly what 
the due process. You know, what's the problem? What's going on? And you, you said you were incarcerated. I don't know the story behind that. Do you want to share? Sure. The incarceration for was for uh, direct criminal contempt of court because I refused to sign and participate in the judge's fraud upon the court. The judge uh, required. Um, hold on, hold on, James. James, hold on. That's very important. What you just said. Um, listen, it's very easy to get somebody for criminal contempt. Why? If a judge creates a false order, right, and some, and it's unjust to follow. Like I heard of a story who died uh, of a woman who died on Micah's Island. She went to pursue a case against her husband. And they took her family's business and gave it to her husband. She said the judge was corrupted. And there were even reporters concerned about this judge. And when she tried to get justice, you know, so you could get a contempt order by the judge. And then if you violate that, now you're a criminal and can be thrown in jail. Is that similar to what happened to you? Yes, the judge intended to intimidate me because he figured me, never having been in trouble with, with the law before, there was no way I was going to walk into jail as opposed to sign his fraudulent order. Surprise, I walked right in. As a matter of fact, it was videotaped. Uh, <laughs> and that made it uh, that made its rounds the day after. What was the order? What was the order? What, what was the false order? The order was to convey a property in my person. The property was held in a trust. The judge was foreclosed upon having any personal uh, jurisdiction over that trust because the the trust and the trustee had never been properly served uh, nor noticed. So it, it was a situation where there was a procedural problem, and the the actual motion should never have been entertained in the first place because it was brought with unclean hands. So the judge decided to hear the the motion with unclean hands to find me guilty and to order me to convey something that was impairing a contract. Uh, and by, by impairing the contract, it would have harmed a beneficiary. And I would not do that. You know, that's very important what you're saying, because there are cases where I've seen it, where there was a will and it was left to a, someone. And um, they, the judge made the person who was the sole beneficiary of a valid will settle with other people and you have no right to settle either the will is valid or it's not if it's valid then it goes to the beneficiary if it's not valid then you can't have the right to settle it and give half of the the funds and by the way after they appoint an attorney in the court and everybody gets access there's no money left but i i actually saw that and i was shocked that was, you know, many years ago, I noticed that, but now nothing surprises me. But what you're saying is something very similar. You're saying that you had a proceeding and that um, you, the, a trust, these are, these are legal instruments that are created to protect someone. And then they, they want to basically mutilate that legal instrument and have you uh, sign over things because I guess, um, Somehow you were supposed, you could make it all right. You could do the judge's uh, bidding in this the situation. Judge, the judge was actually committing a class D uh, felony uh, by, uh, on the bench by violating New York State Penal Code Section 135.60 and 65, coercion for an unlawful order. And uh, to have gone as far as... Beyond Hello? just a, a decision I didn't like. It goes beyond just a decision I didn't like. It goes beyond a judicial error. It goes to willful and malicious intent to commit a criminal act on the bench. And that is a high crime and misdemeanor. Well, and so here you are. Hold on a second. You know, because my book is filled with this, not my words, but uh, law professors and everyone, they talk about uh, false orders intellectual dishonesty, it's rampant in the courts and the appellate division doesn't fix it. And plus I put the code of judicial conduct in there. So if you're before a judge who's engaging in criminal misconduct or any misconduct, you're supposed to have access to the, to the uh, judicial ethics committee. They're supposed to step in 
at that time, because you're supposed to get, I know, I know you could laugh all you want, but that's the rules, that's the laws, because you're supposed to have a court that's uncompromised, and you're not, in other words, the whole weight is put on the litigant when a judge misbehaves, and now your whole case is, is becomes a matter of you trying to just correct the record, correct the judge's behavior, and your whole case is gone. So you said you said to the judge, so what did he say? He said, listen, sign this or go to jail. Is that what you're saying? Literally, yes. And, and, and what would you have before. signed? What would you have signed? What right did you have to give over? Uh, I would have signed a, uh, a bargain and sale deed incorrectly, I might add, uh, to transfer a property out of the trust. And I was being coerced to do so. And I knew it. They count on, on pro se litigants not knowing the law not knowing their rights and the reason i laughed before was and no oversight I, and no oversight yeah i no, because i actually filed an article 78 proceeding against the judge uh one of my filings an article 78 is a proceeding where you go to the appellate division you say listen help me out here the judge he's doing something wrong i mean obviously so how well did you do in the appellate division because i think it's a myth an appellate division uh remedy and i can go into that for that article 78 was judge miller in the second circuit who sits, Is that Robin miller? What, uh, who sits what? as the ethics chair what's his first name uh, i don't remember his first name okay so but so you I go to a judge was the ethics chair the ethics chair yes so of course he's going to do what's right you cited it you cited the code of judicial conduct what happened he refused to sign it in fact the next time I showed up with another Article 78, he wouldn't even see me. Right. So it was it was dismissed with no record. And all that power is laying on your chest. It's like, where's the police? Where's the DA? Where where is anyone? And here you have to be in a court with all the power directed on you. And so well, this judge, he's still sitting on the bench. He put you into jail because you didn't sign something that that you showed was illegal as a matter of law and ethics? Yep. I had a 30-day sentence, of which I got kicked out after 11 days. Um, it, uh, I spent the first five days in solitary, just because that's the incoming Solitary? Procedure. Solitary. <laughs> wow. Unbelievable. That's part of their incoming procedure. So what was that like for you? I mean, a guy who never had any legal problems, you have this trust, you just went to court to get to get help. That's why I think the court should stay out of family's business. They don't do what's in the best interest of the children. They don't help. They're not doing what they need to for the mental, mentally ill people. I mean, what the hell are they doing? So basically, yeah, I mean, this is a, a terrible, We there's so many people who are terrible in so many ways but they're so broken and separated and they need to come together these this cannot exist anymore yeah well i sought to file a petition for having his corpus in federal court but i i did not uh, uh i did not have more than uh one access and i needed more than that to complete it uh, well hold on a second before you talk right about access. this well, wait, they put you in jail for 30 days. You now are, see, that's what they, what's happening with Giuliani. They suspend him. So it's no longer Giuliani. It's suspended Giuliani, right? Without due process. So it's no longer about you. Now you're a criminal. Now you have a criminal record and they discredited you, right? Completely. So now you come the out. Legitimacy process. They've taken everything from me, including my fear. So now what I what I've done is I've challenged the system. I've actually threatened to become arrested several times after that. Um, and, and to great effect, because I use that as a point of civil disobedience. Uh, I challenged Julian, uh, excuse me, not Giuliani Como, uh, with respect to his mask mandate being unconstitutional. And I, I wrote a five page memorandum of law. I was just having this massive civil disobedience protest of one person. And I told one of that a, a, a civil disobedience protest of that magnitude would attract absolutely no traction at all and change nothing. What ended up happening was 
New York State Judicial Law Section uh, 240.35 sub 4 was suspended on May 14th of 2020 and repealed about three weeks later as a result of what I did. It wasn't what I was shooting for because they think that was a good statute, but it caused the governor to back down because they knew I wasn't going to back down. I was, uh, I was preparing a petition for habeas corpus and certiorari to the Supreme Court of the United States for my uh, arraignment plea because in, in the state of New York, would have either been in public, the, the public place of the courtroom, wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. And the combination of the administrative order, the executive order, and, and the penal code, illegal to be in public, under color of the law for any reason at all. And, and that's just so blatantly unconstitutional, I couldn't stomach it. So I walked into the, the uh, Central Islip Courthouse without a mask at the end of April, and... and and they said, you can't be in here without a mask. And, and they made me put on a mask. And I said, you don't have the authority to require me to violate the penal code. And that's what led to the suspension and uh, repeal of that penal code. On May 26th, I did it again. Uh, I, the courts had been closed to the public. And I, I do court watching for, for people. And I was asked to court watch virtual courts. And can you explain? Can you explain explain court watching? I go and I sit and I watch the proceedings for any kind of judicial error uh, and any kind of error at all that might occur, and help the the litigants understand what's happening because a lot of times they don't understand what's happening. And when when I went to this particular uh, proceeding. Uh, it was completely blocked to the public. So I filed into the case uh, an amicus curiae brief. Office of Court Administration. And uh, pursuant to New York State Judicial Law Section 4, they had no recourse other than to grant me access. Uh, I would go into judge after judge, starting with judge... Condon in uh, Riverhead that was overseeing the criminal case about uh, Michael Valva and Anne regarding the death of, of Thomas Valva. Um, the mother, Justina, was not allowed into the June 2nd proceeding. And I actually had to aggressively challenge the, the, the court to get any kind of access to the public. But I succeeded. I succeeded on Monday. And that required quite the, the process. And I've also, of course, said most recently what I've done is the challenge. I can't before I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Wait a second. Say that again. Sorry? I can't. I couldn't hear you I in the last. Okay. I, uh, I'm challenging cameras in court. I've literally walked into Judge John J. Leo's chambers, December 23rd of 2020. Uh, after having exactly what I was doing, after having asked permission, after having born, gotten denied, uh, I walked in with my cell phone, opened up Facebook, and live streamed, walked into the courtroom, live streaming, holding up the phone so that it was being live streamed. And so I found New York State Judicial Law Section 52. Uh, rules of the Chief Judge of the State of New York, uh, 22 NYC RR, Section 29 and 131. Uh, the policy and procedures of the court officers, the orders uh, verbal, the laying uh, of, of Judge John J. Leo to him in his courtroom. I am not leaving unless I set precedent or until I get standing in federal court. Well, I walked out the front door and I was shocked. <laughs> I figured, well, I, I was definitely going to get unlawfully arrested. Uh, and uh, because I have the clue. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. In public, public place. Sorry. Uh, I have. I can't hear you. Can't hear you. All right. Uh, let's see if I can. If I can improve the microphone. Okay. So what happened? You you 
they, they could have said, oh, our rules here, we don't let you record proceedings, right? That's right. You know, the joke of it is what's going on in Michigan and other places, like they, they have their, they they allow the the proceedings to be broadcast, but they won't let you record it and they won't leave it out there. And, the, and I think that's a way to shape the public's opinion by allowing certain lawyers, like in Michigan, they allowed this David Fink to basically smear Lynn Wood and Sidney Powell without allowing them to respond back. So, you know, that's, it absolutely is. yeah. So um, it, it, we have the clearly established right to record public officials like judges in public, like the courtroom, subject to reasonable time, place and manner. So what the argument here is what's reasonable time, place and manner. And there there has been New York State Judicial Law Section 218 that supported this, but it expired in 1997 and it was a 10 year experiment. And every time it was suggested that it be made, and the minority uh, prevailed and, and shot it down. So now we've got a situation in 2000 where New York State uh, Civil Rights Law Section 52 was found unconstitutional as applied in one case and facially in another case. In 2003, there was another case that had a, an encyclopedic response uh, that said, yes, it's constitutional constitutional in support of due process. And when, when the two things come into conflict, are you hearing me okay? Yeah, I, I wanna say something. You see what you're pointing out is it's very detailed and I wanna explain a few things. You shouldn't have been doing this alone. A hundred percent, there should be cameras in the courtroom. There should be a database because the judges are not there for themselves and their careers and their attorney careers. They're there for the people. And um, the that's what they, people forgot. Now, I want to tell you this, Frank, Frank Vetro, I had him on, he did the whistleblower documentary. You should watch that. People have, like, he should get behind you and you should get behind him. And Jeffrey Deskovic and his people need to get behind you. We all need to come together. Even Giuliani and Lynn Wood and Sidney Powell, an abuse of power in any court proceeding is an abuse of power in every court proceeding. And the problem is they win when you separate people. Like they divide and they conquer, sort of like what's going on with the January 6th. And they're not charging them with insurrection, I understand. They're basically trying to pound away and get plea bargains to make a facade that this is a criminal, that's a criminal, and that's how they win. We all need to come together with Giuliani. With, with, we need to come together regarding justice pursuit of justice, of due process, no matter if it's civil, no matter if it's misdemeanor, violation, you know, jail, anything. Now, what, what happened here with you um, is very easy. As I said, they, they make an order and the order, as my book talks about, not for me, but by scholars saying that false orders, intellectual dishonesty is rampant. And then the appellate division doesn't fix it. They rely and they reinforce the false order of the trial court and the media doesn't fix it. They just report it. So at the end of the day, basically you're, we're sitting ducks. If a judge mm -hmm. or somebody brings you in, if some say you have somebody and they say, "Oh, I want his house, I want his kids, I want his money, I want his, I want to punish him, I want to throw him in, I want to," anything can happen, and it's been going on for years. That's why what's going on now is nothing new. It's been going on for years. So now you were thrown in jail for all this, and now you're out and you're fighting this. But look how hard you have to fight. Look how many nights and days and your resources and your mind and your time inundated trying to be, you're, you're the uh, criminal, you're, you're like the oversight police here, but with no power, no funding, and it's just you. And you're well, the one who's taking all the hits. And you're not alone. Well, one person has more power than they realize. And uh, that's... that's Thing that I learned in, in doing this. You see, the Constitution is of the form and form of an implied self executing special revocable trust document, such that we, the people, beneficiaries, but. I can't hear you. 
responsibilities of our trustees, including the judges. And that is why I filed a petition for Malone remonstrance in the New York General Assembly uh, for the impeachment of Judge John J. Leo and other relief. Uh, and and oh, I have right to goodness. Do so. I'm going to have you on. You know, Daniel from New Hampshire, who did the remark? You're going to come on. And we got to go through in a quiet setting, look at your documents, look at everything. We're going to talk about your remonstrance that you did. Uh, what's pending now? What's going on right now? Oh, let, let me go up through. Uh, I'll start with trial court. Uh, I have a notice of motion in uh, for submission. We'll see what happens with that. Uh, judge, I'm sure, is going to be inclined to spot they did so with no basis. Uh, but that's what the way for this particular judge, uh, prior history. Uh, I, in the in the federal court, uh, the federal district court, uh, I have the uh, the Cameron and State Court. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? No. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Let me switch microphones. Can you hear me now? Yes. Is this better? Okay. Yes. So in, in federal district court, uh, I have uh, the motion to strike down the prohibition cameras in state court uh, that uh, was rejected sponte dismissal. I think the judge was afraid of what I was writing. And so that hit uh, Court of Appeals. I have I have the petition for memorial and remonstrance in the New York State General Assembly and the judiciary chair of the assembly, uh, that would be Assemblyman uh, Charles David Levine has sent me a letter saying that I need to file it with the Commission on Judicial Conduct. I'm about to write a, a response letter that challenges the legitimacy of that entire approach. And, and that will be a no joke letter. And look at the people running the Commission on Judicial Conduct. How long have they been there? And did any of them also work at the Attorney Ethics Committee? I would look into that. Look into the whole thing. And we'll go through it. And, you know, obviously, um, you uh, you should watch some of my videos because I go through a lot of the things that you're discussing. And then we can go through your case and go through your remonstrance because people have to start standing together. That's the only way through this. And people have to support you, James Kelly. Where could they find mm -hmm. you? On Facebook, really, uh, James Kelly, and I know that's hard to find, uh, but uh, it, it might be easier through one of my groups, End Marriage Licensing Dash NY. Uh, I can be found through that. Uh, one of the things you touched on was uh, judicial independence. You see, the assemblyman is also concurrently an officer of the court. That challenges the the independence of the judiciary, and it challenges the checks and balances upon. Uh, upon the government, and that is foundationally flawed. That's just not acceptable. You see, there's two sets of checks and balances, the three branches upon each other, and then the people upon the government. There are no separation of powers. There's one big rotting stump with the with the executive, the governor. I do a whole presentation on that, and I keep doing it because it never gets old, and I'll show it to you. But everybody has to rely on the same political stump for the donors and to get them into office, to keep them there, to, to uh, you know further their career. And so there's no separation of power in reality. There's the no check in reality. What? the bar has become the ruling aristocracy because it transcends all three branches and that's not acceptable exactly we have to have a show on that um so after this um you know after we do this we finish with this com contact me and we'll go through it because you deserve p people to understand the depth of what you've gone through that to show the law where you say the judge 
was violating and, se- and telling you, it's like having a gun to your head, sign that and, and I'm the boss and if not, go to jail. Right. I mean, if that's what you're saying happened, we want to learn more. We want to see that. And, and he commits uh, a class C felony on the record to do it. And I serve time. <laughs> and you serve time. And that's the way it happens. Because who has the power? Who has the funding? Right. OK, so we're going to we're going to go through that. Um, is there anything else you want to say right now about your. Um... No, I, I think I'm about to lose my battery. OK. Um, is there anybody else that we're going to interview regarding this? Unfortunately, no one a... has come over, so uh, okay, fine. I have to say no. Okay, so well, this was a great. Let let's. Why don't you just take? I'll put you on the screen. Just go around and look at it, and then we'll we'll have a closing of this beautiful event that people went and they were incarcerated and they wanted to uh, try and reestablish their life. What happened to Jeffrey? He got lost? No, I, w- I was here. I was panning for you. Yeah, no, I saw that. That's great. What about Jeffrey? Is he is, okay? Um, over there. And I think he's talking see. to somebody. Let's see. Should I get him on the phone? See if he has any closing words? Absolutely. Hold on. Let's see if I can get Jeffrey on the phone. Maybe that's a little clearer. Uh, he's too busy over there. Okay. That could be. Huh? That could be. So, um, you want to go over to him and see if he wants to say any last words so we can close this out? I can try. Okay, go ahead. I'll fill you. I'll fill in the the audience a little bit and um, wait for you to come back. All right. Hey guys, um, this is the way it works, you know. These are people fighting. What? Is, listen to this. It's like the the poem "If," right? The 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 poem "If" is. I don't know if, if any of you are uh, uh, Rudyard Kipling poem "If," and it's so appropriate about life. Just to read some excerpts. I mean, I surround myself with these very deep. Um, poems and, uh, you know, I read a lot and un- want to understand the what people go through. And, um, you know, he, he uh, in this poem, he says, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, right? That's what happens in the courthouse when they take your case and they usurp it and you have no power and it's all false. And then when you go through all that, it says, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. That's what these people are doing. They are watching that their lives are destroyed, put in jail because you didn't want to sign a document and you you tried to get help and oversight. And then you become a criminal and you spend time in uh, solitary confinement. And so these people, a lot of them were in jail and they're just trying to rebuild their lives. And um, look how much they have to carry on their shoulders to try and uh, get due process. Why is he doing all this? We have all the laws. What good are the courtrooms? What good are the beautiful pillars and the libraries and the robes? What good is all that? What good is all the laws if nobody's following them? What good is the code of judicial conduct? What good is the attorney disciplinary committee? What purpose does it serve if it's not serving to uphold the constitution, uphold the laws and help the people attain access to a fair court, uncompromised court and due process? What good is it? Isn't it just a facade then? Okay, 
Let's go. Let's close this out because you guys are very busy. Um, Jeffrey, hello. There he is. He's still very involved in the conversation. All right. Well, I'm, I'm sure he, he, he asked me to be here, so he wants me to, you know, close this out properly. I think you could uh, just say, excuse me, and uh, tell, ask him how he wants to proceed. Yeah, if I could very quickly. Two words. Well, it's, well firstly, just this, this event has really been incredible. I have a special guest next to me. Uh, you know, this event has attracted high... Uh, profile people, one of them, the gentleman next to me, it's Simon Weprin, who did champion uh, uh, parole reform this last session. He introduced uh, legislation which would require the parole Assemblyman Weprin? That's Assemblyman uh, from the so 22nd District? Accessory rehabilitation rather than nature of the crime. But Susan, would you like to ask the Assemblyman? Yes, uh, well, Assemblyman Weprin from the 22nd District, is that? Are, Say are that you again? The, is this Assemblyman Weprin from the 22nd District? Are you from the 22nd District? 24th. The 24th? I believe I have um, I have a, 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 no, a notice from you regarding my name. I have it on my wall. It was a long time ago, but um, you were kind enough to provide that. So uh, I think, cause there's not too many weapons. So I I may, you know, it's been a long time, but you are always out there, yeah. aren't you Assemblyman Weprin? You are always um, trying to support the causes, right? I try to, I have a brother uh, that was also in the assembly and in the city council. I was in the city council also and the assembly. So do I oh, it could be your brother. I have to go look after the show. Okay, no problem. Okay, so tell me what you're doing there. Well, I'm here uh, supporting uh, formerly incarcerated individuals uh, who are, are entrepreneurs and, and creating businesses. Uh, my good friend uh, Jeff Destovic uh, has been involved uh, in helping form. Uh, you know, he has his story, uh, which uh, he has told uh, over and over again. Uh, and now, as a lawyer, uh, he has been fighting uh, to help uh, to make changes uh, in the uh, prison system, in the correctional facilities, uh, in parole parole reform, uh, and we've been working together uh, on so many of uh, these issues. He's, he's all three branches in one. He just helped create a law, right? He's all three branches in one guy. <laughs> <laughs> all three so, branches in one guy. Yes, all three branches. So thank you so much. That's wonderful. And thank you for being there. We need elected officials to step up and stand by and support people like Jeffrey, like uh, James. Okay, we lost them guys, this is it. So uh, that was Suitcase Sunday. Go to Jeffrey Deskovic's Instagram and um, Facebook and other social media accounts. You can easily find him. You could ask him for any information you want. These are, we all need to support each other and um, you know, this is the way we do it. This is the way we have to do it. And we all have, should stand by injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. So thank you very much for being with me. Sorry for the um, technical difficulties. It does happen, but so glad that you joined and have a great day. Appreciate it.